is titled, and I don't normally give you the title, but this morning I thought it was fitting, Come Quickly, Lord. And then there's a subtitle, Worship, Serve, and Share, which is what we should be doing until um, our Lord returns. So look at verse 8 of chapter 22. 8 and 9, actually. Now I, John saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Now angels are majestic, powerful beings, no doubt. And it's understandable why you would want to fall down on your knees in front of them. And the angel tells John, don't do that. Don't do that. He's glorious. There's no doubt about that. But it's not his glory that's being reflected. It's the glory of God. The glory of, his, of whom he serves shines, reflects through that angel. And God will not share his glory with anyone. Even the appearance of worshiping anyone or other, anything other than God must be avoided in our lives because God is the only one worthy of our worship. God's not going to share his glory with any man and any created being. Nebuchadnezzar learned that, that lesson the hard way, didn't he? He's standing on the wall one day. After God had gotten his attention and warned him quite a few times, he's standing on the wall looking out over the kingdom of Babylon and mentioning how wonderful it is and how great he is and how he did all of this. And when it was all God, it was all God's glory. And the next thing he knew, he was running around eating grass and barking at the moon. <laughs> King Herod, sitting on his throne, his robes glistening in the sun. And the people are looking at him. Ooh, ah, that's not the voice of man. That's the voice of God. And he reveled in those praises. He reveled in that glory. And the next thing you know, he's struck down. Worms are eating him, and he dies a few days later. That's a great warning, isn't it? God is not going to share his glory with anyone. Satan learned that lesson when he wanted worship for himself, and he was thrown out of heaven. And the angel knows all of this. I'm certain the angel has saw Satan fall, and he didn't want any part of this. Now, the Greek word for angel is angelos, and it means, anybody know? Messenger. In Hebrew, the word is malak, and it means the exact same thing. They are messengers of God. And that's what angels do. They carry instructions from God to man. And so the angel puts it in perspective for John. He says, I'm your follow, fellow servant and of, your, of you and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. And then he tells them, worship God. I'm your fellow servant, meaning we serve the same master. I'm your fellow servant of you and the prophets and those who keep the words of the book. Anybody here keep the words of the book? Nobody here this morning complained about air conditioning, I notice. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Like, coming to church this morning, well, I hope Pastor Allen's got the air cranked up again. So our fellow servants are the angels. And basically, we are doing the same ministry, right? We're God's messengers, if you will. We deliver the message of the gospel. God delivers a message to the angels for man, and man delivers the message of God to other men. And so the angel makes it abundantly clear to John, do not worship me. Worship God. And so there's two words that we need to take notice of here this morning. The words worship and servant. And we want the Lord to come quickly, don't we? Amen. But it's been 2,000 years. We're persevering. We're being about our Father's business until he does return. There's things that we must do while we're waiting. And three of those things is worshiping God, serving, and sharing. And we're going to look at all three of those this morning. So the first thing is worship. What's worship? Worship is hard to explain. It's a hard concept to explain. Paul wrote to the Romans, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable, or well-pleasing and perfect. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. 
this passage, we have the elements of worship. Why we worship, the way we worship, and how we are to worship. First, the reason why. The mercies of God. His mercies are renewed every day. And think how merciful God has been just to you alone. Think of, you know, Joe said this morning, what do we have to be thankful for? That's certainly one of them, the mercies of God. Everything he's given us, everything that we have, we do not deserve. Like his unfailing love, his eternal peace, eternal life. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us his righteousness, his eternal security, forgiveness, and reconciliation. And we deserve none of that. We've been justified, sanctified, set free. And listen, we've only scratched the surface here this morning. And knowing what God has given us and knowing that we don't deserve any of it is why we want to praise him and thank him and worship him. Second, Paul tells us what, the way in which we are to worship. We are to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Presenting our bodies means giving our all. It means loving him with all our heart, our soul, our strength, and our minds. As Paul says, it is a sacrifice. I'm giving up something to honor God, whether that's time or resources. Just checking. Rob, would you do me a favor? See if that thing is working. I don't think it is. It's not. Can you hit the cool button, make sure it turns on? We're worshiping when we, when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We're, we're giving God something to honor him. And like I said, whether that be resources or time. And then Paul tells us how we are to worship. By the renewing of our mind. We renew our minds daily. By cleansing them with the word of God. By replacing the ways of the world with the ways of God. And it doesn't mean conforming to the ways of the world. But it means living our lives by the way of God. And we worship him with renewed minds. And where the mind goes, the will will follow. And so will the emotions. So focusing on God with our mind through prayer, through the reading of his word, helps us to submit our lives to him, and it strengthens our love for him. And so Paul gives us the elements of worship. Jesus tells us also how to worship. But a time is coming and is already here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit from the heart, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version, that's why it's a little different, the inner self, and in truth, the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. So we worship God in spirit. When we worship God, we worship him, as I said earlier, with our all with complete abandon. It should be a heartfelt, unscripted, unhindered connection to God. It's giving our life to God. It's giving our all to him. Convicted yet? I certainly am. It's not being fake. It's not putting on a facade. It's not having ulterior motives. It's being real with God. And unless there's a real passion for God in our worship, then we really can't worship in spirit, can we? But that, when we worship in spirit only and not in truth, it just becomes an emotional thing. It becomes an emotional connection. You need truth along with spirit. And truth means having the knowledge, the truth of who God is. So we can worship in truth. The more we know of God, the more we appreciate who he is and what he's done, the more we appreciate him, the more we worship him, and the deeper our worship goes. And the more we know him, the more we focus on him, because it should always be about God. It should never be about us. Knowing what Jesus did to forgive our sins, knowing that he willingly, lovingly gave his life for us, leads us to a greater appreciation of the sacrifice that God made on our behalf. How could you not fall to your knees and worship when you think of what Jesus did as he, as he, gave, as he gave his all for us? Amen? So here we are, and the angel tells John to worship God in him alone. The next thing I want to look at is a servant. What is a servant? And I think sometimes we get confused between a servant and a volunteer. So I want to read what a servant is and what a volunteer is. A volunteer sees their involvement in church as community service. Servants call it a ministry. Volunteers will count the cost to serve. 
Servants serve despite the cost. Volunteers see their commitment as obligations to fulfill. Servants see it as an opportunity to be used by God. Volunteers don't practice. They don't prepare for what they need to do. Servants come ready to serve prepared as they can possibly be. Volunteers are not open to constructive criticism. They get defensive about it. Servants are grateful for feedback because they want to be the very best that they can be. Volunteers want to quit at the first sign of adversity or discouragement. Servants just roll up their sleeves, dig in, and persevere. Volunteers serve at their convenience, when it is comfortable for them. Servants serve when and where they are needed. Volunteers are not flexible. Servants adjust to whatever the need is. But I think some of the greatest differences are these. Volunteers are asked to serve. Servants are called to serve. Volunteers serve with a, single, with a, with a sense of pride. Servants serve in humility. Servants humbly depend on and trust in God, and they're prepared for whatever comes their way. Now listen, we've all been given gifts here, every one of us. We have all have talents here. And it's not for our own enjoyment. It's for what? The edification of the body. We serve God with those talents, and we edify the body with those talents. Paul wrote, and again I'm reading from the Amplified Version, and he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints, God's people, for works of service, to build up the body of Christ, the church, Ephesians 4.12. And I think we, as I said, we get confused between what a servant is and a volunteer. And as you just learned, they are nowhere near the same. Jesus came, came to serve, not to be served. He never said, I came to volunteer. He said, I came to serve. And servants make a commitment. No matter what the cost, no matter what the inconvenience, they commit to the task at hand. And if you're struggling here this morning as to whether or not you are called to be a servant, listen to the words of Jesus. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. John 13, verses 13 through 15. Washing the feet of the guests when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, was one of the lowliest, the jobs of one of the lowliest servants in the household. Now, Jesus did that for his disciples. And when he did it, he said, now do the same for one another. Jesus was willing to roll up his sleeves and serve, and that is our example. So the question is, am I called to be a disciple? Well, let me answer that question with a question. Are you his disciple? If you are, then you are called to serve. Look at verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal the words of this prophecy, the words of the prophecy of this book, for the, for the time is at hand. So John's told not to seal up the prophecies in this book. In fact, John has been instructed to record the prophecies in the book and then distribute them to the churches. Jesus had told them, write what you see, Write in a book and send it to the seven churches. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are, the things which will take place after this. So the record John has kept is revealed to the disciples of his day. It was read at those churches. And it's being revealed to us today, isn't it? And this is in stark contrast to what Daniel was told to do with the prophecies he was shown. Daniel was told, therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future, Daniel 8, 26. He was also told, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, many have heard that that means the time we live in. And I don't disagree with that. This does refer to the time we're living in. But it doesn't mean what they think it means. Because people get on planes, people get on trains, they travel to and fro. That's not what this means. Daniel's told to shut up the words and to seal the book. And then he's given a time frame of when it should be, when it should be revealed, right? When the end comes, when knowledge increases, when people are going to and fro. So let's take this step by step. Daniel's told to shut up the book, the words of this prophecy. And that's kind of like in that, in Aramaic, it's like, 
being put into protective custody. He was to guard those words until it was time to release them. Daniel was to put a seal on the words. That means like putting a, a seal of a magistrate or a king on a document. And so that document could not be opened until the person whom it was intended for was given it to, was given to, was it given to. And so he used to seal up the words of this prophecy until the people who it is intended to are ready to look at it. And so when will it be released? At the end times, the time of the end, which means when time has reached its limit, the end of time, when time has reached its limit. To and fro means from one starting point to another. And what that means is that people have gone over these prophecies from head to toe, from top to bottom, and it's changed over the years. We're teaching on Daniel on, on Wednesday nights, and the prophecies or the interpretation of these of this prophetic dreams have changed. Not because the Bible's changed, but because the geopolitical situation around the world is changing on a regular basis. It's in flux. And the interpretation of the prophecy has to be continually adjusted. Because, listen, there's nations and things going on now that didn't exist 50 years ago. Well, not that they didn't exist. They just weren't part of the, they weren't power players. They are now. And so things are changing. And the only way we're going to fully understand some of the prophecies of this book is during the tribulation when the Antichrist comes to power. And so John's told to unseal the prophecy. It's been 359 years since Daniel had his dreams and visions. Could this mean that the end times are here? That this is the time when these prophecies are for? The answer, I think, is yes. Because the prophecies in Daniel and the prophecies in Revelation are very, are very well connected. Matter of fact, you really can't understand the book of Revelation without Daniel. The fact that these are unsealed now means that we are the recipients of these prophecies. The last day's clock began when Jesus' foot, when Jesus came into this world, I should say. We are the final generation. How many churches was John instructed to write letters to? Seven. Was there an eighth church? We are the seventh church. We are the church of Laodicea. There is no eighth church. We are the final generation. And we are living in a day when these prophecies are coming to light. We're beginning to see more and more and more how this is going to play out. And the closer it gets to the return of Jesus, the better we're going to be able to understand him. And as I always said, that if we're seeing the shadows of things that are happening now, shadows of things that are going to happen in the tribulation, we're seeing them now, how close is the real thing from happening? But it goes so much deeper than that. Knowledge has increased. Your knowledge has increased. You have, with greater knowledge, comes greater responsibility. And that's the share part of this. We are to share this gospel message because we know what the end is like. We know what's coming. We've been warned. It's time for us to warn others, to share that gospel message. Listen, I can't tell you, the, the book of Revelation and what's going on in the world today, sharing the gospel has actually become easier. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with family, and, and they almost always include this statement. You know, that's exactly what the Bible said would happen. That's an open door. That's an open door for you to share what the Bible says about these prophecies and then share the gospel message with them. We hold the truth in our hands, and the time for that to be revealed is now, in the days in which we live, the last days. John was told to write it down and distribute it, and we are told to do the same thing, distribute the gospel message to the world around us. Verse 11 says, he was unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still. He was righteous, let him be righteous still. He was holy, let him be holy still. And so the meaning of this verse is when we do share the gospel message, people are going to respond differently, right? That's nothing new. We know that. We see that in our own families. But simply put, if the word of God cannot persuade a man to follow God, then the judgment of God will never persuade him. Men's hearts are going to get harder and harder and harder. And the proof of that is found in Revelation 16. Men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who is power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. They would not repent. 
They're shaking their fist at God. Even though there's trials and tribulations all around them, they're shaking their fist at God. They refuse to turn to God. And so those who remain unjust will be unjust when Jesus returns. Those who are filthy in thought and deed will be found filthy in thought and deed when Jesus returns. Those who are righteous and holy, that will not change either. They will remain that way when Jesus returns. Because it's going to come to a point, and it's getting there faster than we would like, isn't it? Where the conscience of men will be seared. Paul wrote to Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared, seared with a hot iron. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-2. through two. Seared literally means corduroyed cauterized when your conscience is seared it's been rendered insensitive it can't feel it can't think anymore when your conscience gets that way it doesn't work properly anymore it's as if there's spiritual scar tissue over it, it the senses have been dulled and for many the way they are now sadly is the way they're going to remain the only thing that can change them the only one that can change them is by turning to Christ Jesus and being changed by the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Listen, if you're righteous and holy now, continue to fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith, and you will be found holy and righteous when Jesus returns. Verses 12 and 13. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. And so this tells us a few things. Namely, we need to be patient. James wrote, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it to, until it receives the early and latter rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, since no one knows the day or the hour of his return, we are to wait patiently for his coming. But waiting patiently doesn't mean being, compl being complacent. And it doesn't mean falling asleep. It means being about our Father's business while we wait, sp spreading the news, the good news of the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Because... I'm hoping everyone in this room is aware that that could happen at any moment. It could happen before we finish this message today. But people still mock us. And believe me, I've had people tell me, yeah, you've been talking about Jesus coming back for how long now? Not me personally. It feels so. My knees feel sometimes like it's been 2,000 years, but it's not, it's not, it hasn't been that long for me. But it's been a while we've been talking about this, right? Peter said this would happen. Know this first of all. That in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. Where is he? Where's Jesus? It's been 2,000 years. Where is he? For one, th hey, listen, it's been 2,000 years for us. For him, a day is what? Like a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years like a day. For him, he's only been gone a couple days. So that's number one. Number two, the Bible says that God desires that not one would perish, not one. And personally, I am so glad that Jesus did not return before in 2001 because I would have been lost. Third, he's called us to persevere, hasn't he? When we wait, how many here like to wait? I'm not raising my hand. That's the one thing God's always working on me. But it builds character, I hear. And it reveals our weaknesses, doesn't it? And lastly, don't look at this as it's been a long time. Look at it as we have more opportunity to spread the gospel message. We have more opportunity to serve God. To live each day as if today could be the day that he comes. He says, behold, I am coming quickly. When we hear those words, it should fill us with anticipation and excitement. And then he says, there is going to be a reward for your perseverance. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So we are going to receive crowns when Jesus returns. 
Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on indoors, it will be, receive a, re, a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. So what Paul's saying is that you're going to go to heaven. Just some of you are going to, some of us maybe, going to have a little hint of smoke on us when we get there. We're not going to be judged, so don't get excited. We are not going to be judged. Jesus paid the price for our sin. Jesus took God's wrath for our sin. Jesus took his, our judgment upon him. But our works are going to be judged. And if there are works done for the kingdom, for the benefit of the kingdom, there will be gold, silver, precious stone. They'll pass through the fire. If there are works done outside the kingdom in our own selfishness, then those works are going to burn up, wood, hay, and stubble. And my prayer for myself is that when I get to this point, that some of my works, at least, are gold, silver, precious stone. I hate to see them all burn up. And I wouldn't count on the fact that how we persevered through this and what we did with the time that we were allotted on this earth is not going to be judged on that day. And there's something to think about. Look at verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. This is where mankind will be separated. By those who have obeyed his word, they're given the right to eat of the tree of life. They're given the right to enter into the new city, Jerusalem. Now, being outside the city, not having that right, is meaning the lake of fire, in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there will be the enemies of the word, those who've rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior. To be called a dog, especially in that culture, was a slang word. It was probably one of the worst insults you could be called because it meant that you were impure. And those with impure hearts and impure minds will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that anyone's had an impure thought in their lifetime here as a Christian is going to go to hell. That's not what that means. You're covered by the blood of Christ. You have been forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future. No one in this room is perfect. If you think you're perfect, just ask your wife and she will straighten you out. I know Rosa never said you were perfect, Lewis. Sorcerers could be those steeped in the worship of other gods. It could be those who practice witchcraft. It could refer to that. But more than likely, sorcerer is where we get our word pharmakia from, or pharmacy. And it refers to drug addiction. Now, many have come out of that. I know many who have come out of the life of addiction and have learned to love Jesus more than their addiction. And that really is the key. When I was in the U-turn program ministering there, those guys, they'd ask me all the time, how do we do this? And I said, listen, when I, the answer I'm going to give you is a simple, basic answer, and you're not going to like it because what it means is you have to love Jesus more than you love your drug. And I know that's hard to do, but that's really the secret to it. It's a secret to any sin. You have to love Jesus more than whatever sin you're involved in. But sadly, there are, more, there are many who still love getting high more than they love Jesus, and they refuse to change. And if they consistently, time after time after time, refuse the help of Jesus, refuse to turn to Jesus, and die in that sin, then they're lost. Now, we understand the sexually immoral, right? The rapists, the abusers, the pedophiles. And I pray that there is a place in hell that's so much hotter than other places. And that's where they are. I just, I pray, I hope that that's the case. But liars... I was taught in Catholic school that that's like a menial sin, right? You can lie. It's not that big of a deal. Why is a liar in there? Lying is an abomination to the Lord. It's one of the most heinous sins that Satan is accused of. You are the father of lies. It's deception. And deception in any form is an abomination to God. It's by lying 
that the enemy leads us even to this day into sin, isn't it? He deceives us, whispering in our ear, you can have another drink. It's not going to hurt anything. Hey, you guys love each other. It doesn't matter if you have sex outside of marriage. You can take that home with you. Nobody's looking. That's what he whispers on our ear, enticing us to do, to fall into that trap. It's the lies and deception of the enemy that still lead people into destruction today. And that's why lying and those who practice that are such an abomination to God. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Just another advantage to being in heaven is the air conditioning works perfectly. It is the perfect temperature for everyone. So there could be no confusion as to who this message is from. And in addition, he leaves no confusion to the fact that he is the Messiah. And by the way, shockingly, Jesus is Jewish. Sorry. Jesus isn't a Christian. I know I said that once and people looked at me like, are you lost your mind, Pastor? Of course Jesus was a Christian. Jesus is not a Christian. Jesus is Jewish. Sorry. He's Jewish. And he says it right here. He is the offspring of David. He's Jewish. David was Jewish. But only the offspring of David is going to be allowed to sit on the throne of David, meaning that he is saying he is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And he says it like this, so there is no confusion. The Messiah is not Buddha. He's not Joseph Smith. He's not Vishnu. He's not Mahdi. He's not Fauci. Yeah, like I threw that in there, huh? Jesus is the only Messiah, the only one who died for our sins, Jesus. And he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, preparing for the return, his return, to come and get his bride, the church. And so Jesus has sent a messenger from across the ages with this letter to be delivered to us. Feel special? Have you ever wondered or ever wished that Jesus would just send you an email? Lord, just send me an email so I can get this straight. He's told us everything we need to know right in this book. Have you ever heard the acronym B-I-B-L-E? Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth? You have it right in your hands. Jesus has sent you a communication. The question is, are we opening it up? Are we reading it? He's speaking to us. Are we listening? Verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. There's two invitations here. One of the spirit and one from the bride, the church. And they both say, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely freely they call out come quickly lord jesus come in triumph come in victory come in majesty but come quickly i know that's been our prayer recently even more than before right come so that every knee who refuses to bow now will bow to you as lord and king comes so that every tongue that's denied your name will confess you as lord and the invitation is to come to come to Jesus, those who are thirsty, those who are thirsting for everlasting life, to come and drink from the stream of life. Because until you come to Jesus, you cannot say with any desire in your heart, come quickly, Lord. But know this, he is not coming for you unless you come to him first. Amen? Amen. Verses 18 and 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to the, him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So these are the last words of Jesus to his disciples. You know, when he was on the Mount of Olives and he ascended, just before he ascended into heaven, he said, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
But these words here in chapter 22 of Revelation are the last words he will speak until he returns. And he sends them to his disciples, both past, present, and future. He's giving us a message. And the message contained in this book is of heaven and hell. It's of sin and forgiveness. It's of justice and grace. It is the gospel message, plain and true. From Genesis to Revelation, this book has one central theme. The salvation of mankind through his Savior. And he's entrusted us, the same as he entrusted his disciples 2,000 years ago, to deliver that message to the world. And the question for us today is what are we doing with what we've been entrusted with? What are we doing with his word that he's left for us? God tells us that he values his word above his name. His word, his message to this world is that important because it's a message of faith, hope, and love. And isn't that exactly what the world needs today? God wants the world to know him through this book. But there are those who've perverted the word of God. There are those who've subtracted from it, meaning they're changing the gospel message to fit their lifestyle when they should be allowing the gospel message to change their lives. Some have added to this message, making it too overwhelming. Some have distorted it for their own profit, for their own self-centered motives. But contained in this book is a book of warnings, life and death warnings, because some men have perverted this word and by doing so have caused many to fall away, God gives them an especially harsh warning that the plagues in this book would come upon them. But worse yet, that they would not enter the city of Jerusalem and they would not be written in the Lamb's book of life. This book is not only a book of prophecy, it's a book of warning. We're almost done. I know you guys are hot. We're almost done. Just think of our brothers and sisters in China who are sitting in a small room somewhere with no windows, no air conditioning, doing this illegally. You know, I worked on a railroad for almost 25 years. And we have a, a thing called a blue flag. It's a metal rod with a blue, actual blue flag attached to it. And we learned early on in safety class that that blue flag is there to save lives. You put it on the end of a track, and when you see it, you know that there are men working on that track. Now, I knew this, even though I was a new conductor at the time. So I'm working on a job with a conductor and engineer. I'm the brakeman. And for some reason, they thought, it was, they thought it was good to put me on the hind end of the move. And by that, it means that the engine is way out there, and the hind end is way over there, and I'm the engineer's eyes right, and ears. And I've got a radio, and I'm looking and I'm watching as we're riding along. And I'm looking around, you know, not paying attention. And I look up, and there's a blue flag. And we knock it down, and we run over it. And I'm smart enough to stop the move, and I don't say, hey, we just ran over a blue flag because we'd all be out of a job. So I said, hey, can you come down here for a minute? i got to show you something. So the conductor comes down. He says, ah, oh, I weren't paying attention, were you? I said, I don't know what you two were doing up there, but no, I wasn't paying attention. So we pull the train up, and we pull the blue flag up, and we straighten it out, and we go along our merry way. No harm, no foul, that's how you live on a railroad. The point is that we have red flags all the time in our lives, don't we? The Lord puts warnings in our lives all the time. And we run right over them sometimes. Why? Because we really want to do what the Lord's warning us not to do. And even when we do it and we get in trouble, what's the next thing we do? We cry out to the Lord, save me, Lord. And here's the great thing about our God. He'll save us. He'll rescue us. He might let us stew in it for a little while just to learn a lesson, but he'll rescue us. Pay attention to those flags. They're there for a reason. Pay attention to the warnings in this book. They're there for a reason. They could save your life one day. Let's finish up with verses 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Again, the one who testifies to the words of this book is faithful and true. What's contained in this book is nothing but the truth. And Jesus reminds us again that he's coming quickly. Now, he said that three times in this chapter alone. 
If Jesus says something three times, do you think it's important? Do you think that his last words to his disciples are important? Do you get the impression that Jesus wants us to be prepared for his coming? Absolutely he does. For some, sadly, it will be like a thief in the night. But for us who know the truth, we're prepared. We're always looking up. And until that time comes, until he does come for us, we are to testify of the truth, to the truth contained on the pages of this book, this Bible that we hold so near and dear to us. And until we see him face to face, we have his grace, we have his mercy, we have his love to sustain us. So yeah, come quickly, Lord Jesus, amen. And if you want to see Jesus face to face, that's why we do this every week. That's why we go through the ABCs of salvation. It's as simple as ABC. A, admit that you're a sinner, that you've fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. That we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no way you were working your way into heaven. You cannot do enough good works to get to heaven. And if you could, Jesus would never have had to die on the cross for your sin. Paul wrote, it's by grace we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. We didn't do this. We couldn't do this. It's a gift of God, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. The only way to be forgiven of our sin, past, present, and future, is to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that brings us to B. Believe with all your heart that he died for our sins, that he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Paul wrote, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him would not be put to shame. Romans 10, verses 10 through 11. <clears throat> and once you admit you're a sinner and believe that Jesus has died for your sins, and you confessed of that sin, and you repented of that sin, then call, see, call upon the name of the Lord. Confess that you can't do this on your own, that you want to submit your life to him and surrender your will to him. Romans 10.9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will what? Be saved. So if you surrender to Jesus today, if you've never made that decision, you'll be reconciled to God. You will be, you'll no longer be his enemy. You'll be an heir to the kingdom of heaven. You'll be justified, sanctified, washed clean of all your sin, past, present, and the future. And if this is what you want with all your heart, that I implore you, if you're listening to the sound of my voice this morning and you've never given your heart to Jesus, to do that today, to fall on your knees, to give your heart to Jesus. Let's pray. And bow your heads in prayer. And while the heads are bowed this morning, because I never want to take for granted that everyone here knows Jesus, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, just slip up your hand. Just slip up your hand. I'm going to pray with you. Thank God everyone here has eternal life. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, most importantly, we are so grateful that you're coming back for us. Lord, as things get harder and harder, as things get even more dangerous in this world, Lord, let us not look forward to just getting out of here because we don't like what's going on. Let us look forward to seeing you to seeing your face, to being with you. Let that be what excites us. Let that be what encourages us. And may we always encourage one another with those words. Jesus is coming back for us. Maranatha. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So this